Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode two of our API Facade webinar series. All right, so let's, uh, let's dig in. As a reminder, we have a fantastic group of folks do, that do API stuff on Google Groups. You can see the URL there, or you can just Google for API Craft. We also have all of these videos available up on YouTube. This is after we record today. That's where this, this uh, stuff will end up. And we have an IRC channel on Freeno, API-Craft. And we'd love to see you hang out there as well. So this is uh, part two of our four-part series. Last week, we introduced the API facade pattern. Uh, as an overview, that pretty much answered the question of why this type of thing is interesting. This episode, we're going to move on to talk about some of the common, common patterns that we see. And you could think of this as, uh, as the what, the what what kind of problems we're going to solve and what kind of things we're going to do with the pattern. And then next week, we'll go into more of the how, the specific technology. And then finally, we'll talk about the who, who, who needs to be on the team to help you do this stuff. Okay, so here's the uh, agenda for today's episode. First, we're just going to do a quick couple slide recap of what the API facade was all about. And then we're going to dig into half a dozen patterns or uses of the API facade pattern. We'll start with errors. We'll move on to data stubs, URL mapping, versioning, data formats, and then finally, uh, just a quick reminder that this applies for internal systems and external systems in the same way. Okay, so a quick recap on the API facade. Uh, this is what we want to enable is an application developer to have a clean set of uh, APIs to access all your stuff. And what we don't want to do is that we don't want to do it this way. This was the anti-pattern from last week where you start from your core individual silos of systems and you try to build up toward uh, either a standard or some kind of design document or you know emulate your competitors. Instead, what we want to do is decompose that one big problem into these three little problems where you create the ideal design, you have this facade uh, bit, which is what we're talking about, and then have some stuff that helps you mediate between the facade and those backend systems. For the rest of today's episode, we're kind of going to just wave our hands between the facade and the mediation layer, and we'll dig into that more next episode when we talk about the how and the technology that's involved. So now let's dig into these six common patterns. Let's start with errors. A lot of folks will ask, well, why would you, why would you start thinking about all the serious API stuff um, by starting with errors? And this is my little, uh, this little cheer I put together this morning. When I say errors, you say test-driven development. Most good development shops nowadays are doing something like test-driven development, behavior-driven development, you can call it what you like. But the key thing is, the key idea with test-driven development is you build test cases and they fail, and it's the errors, the problems that you have with the system that help guide the developer toward creating the right app. And this notion is more important in the world of APIs and apps than it is even in the world of, say, embedding a software library or working with your teammates on the same exact source tree because the black box is much more strongly enforced with a web API than it is pretty much any other uh, way of doing software development. So that is to say the API errors are very important. So that's where we're going to start. And the idea is to do this. If you start with the facade and the little comment on the bottom there is to say there is nothing behind the facade. Just assume you have the facade set up in splendid isolation. It's not connecting with any of your internal systems yet. The first thing to get right is all of the error codes. Um, you, in previous webinars, we talk about these are the eight that I think are interesting. You can narrow that down to three. You can blow it up to whatever number is appropriate for your, for your domain. The idea is to make sure that even if no services are, are tagged on this thing yet, you can actually start doing interesting thing with errors. Get those error messages in place because then you can start to build your test suite in the right way, um, including both the HTTP error codes and the, the payload response. And here's a little trick that uh, we, we worked on with a pretty large API provider about a year ago, and that is sometimes you want to explicitly cause arrays to happen. And this is a little trick we, we came up with, and I think it's a pretty cool pattern to use, which is if you put arrays uh, query param in your HTTP request, it will just raise that, that HTTP code back to you. Um, so you can imagine again, when you're, when you're building a test suite, this is something that you, would might, you might like to, to, to do to make sure that your application logic 
can handle the exceptions in the way that you want them to. The little note there is to not use this in production. It's a little bit too powerful and dangerous uh, there, where someone might accidentally put that stuff in their code. Um, so just be thoughtful about how you, how you move that from your testing server out to the production server. So that's the, uh, that's the idea there. With those couple of things, you can, really, you can be on your way to handling errors pretty strongly. And then this is how it gets implemented. So now you can imagine you've, you've designed from the outside in your set of eight HTTP codes or five or whatever it is. But let's say you've got this big system. Maybe it's something that's been built on uh, a .NET framework a few years back. Microsoft has a proprietary well, an extension of the HTTP status code 449 we try with. And um, that's not something most, say, iPhone developers today are going to be thinking about. So what you want to be able to do is a mapping from whatever that response is, in this case 449, into something that is more aligned with what the developers are thinking about today. So this is where you would say, hey, when the response comes back at the facade layer, we're going to have like a lookup table that's going to change this from 449 into 404 so that our, our core developers have an idea of what we're, what we're talking about there. So that's an idea of where you start with you know, your design intent. Here are the HTTP codes. Here's the response that we want back. You can have some controls over the facade with the idea of raising the error. And then finally, um, as you're testing it out and building it out, you plug in the internal system into that facade. That's the pattern that we're going to do for all this stuff. The good news with this, this approach with the facade is it gets pretty simple and uh, pretty repeatable. So that's the idea of errors. Now what about data stubs? Data stubs, ideally, even if you had nothing in the, behind the facade, you'd like to stub out what the request, I'm sorry, what the response data would look like. So you can have the facade return that directly to you. Again, without anything behind the facade, you, you're looking at something like this. And just like we saw the trick with the previous example of forcing the raise to happen, you can do the same thing with the mock. And uh, just setting mock equals true, you can have a little shunt in the facade that says, we're gonna just bring back the stub. Again, that allows you to create that predictable behavior uh, that you wanna have to get you know, proper test-driven development off the ground. The next URLs, this of course for me is the starting point because I think the, the way that the, a proper API is designed and how it expresses itself the strongest affordance is the URL. It's what the developers are most likely to react to. So this is really where, I, in my opinion, the facade pattern starts to really show its colors. So keep in mind, this is the goal. You have an application developer who wants to see something as simple as this. In order to get a collection of accounts, they like to do an HTTP get on slash v2 slash accounts and go for it. However, you might have a backend system that looks something like this. This is actually taken from a version of the salesforce.com API which there's just a lot of confusing stuff. Essentially, their internal systems are uh, exposing themselves in a, in a not very polite way to the application developer. So somehow we need to go from what the application developer wants to what the backend system is going to give us. And that's just a matter of um, doing this type of URL mediation at the layer of the facade. So you, we, you show on the, on the outside the accounts, and then as it gets through the proxy, we actually know how to switch that into whatever that, that big backend system uh, actually knows how to handle. Here's another sort of uh, additional item on, you know, you can think of it as URL support. There are cases out there where clients, certain clients have limitations in terms of the HTTP methods that they support. So for example, if you have a client app whose framework doesn't support the HTTP delete method, uh, you can do something like this, where you have method be an optional param and as the request comes into the proxy, the proxy actually changes the HTTP method from get to delete, and then it strips out the, that, the method equals delete query param that's hanging off the back there and translates it into the original request of the backend system. So you get uh, a whole lot of power without having to touch the canonical system that the whole business is, is relying upon. Uh, next is versioning. And uh, in previous talks, you can check out how when we talk about API design, we talk about um, some the principles of versioning. Uh, I'm not going to go into that here. The key thing here is the, the, the assumption is whenever you version your API, say from version 2 to version 3, there is some period of time that you need to have both versions supported and out there in the wild. Uh, and, the, you know, the case might look like this, where you have a fast developer who's maybe built a web app and has complete control over how that web app is adopted, uh, they can go ahead and build stuff out on v3, and that's what they want to see. 
In the meantime, you have a slow developer who just can't get all of their mobile app developers to upgrade the app. They need more time. So they want to be able to have um, version two in place. And maybe even the, one developer needs to have code that's running against both versions. So the way that you handle that, of course, is regardless of which request comes into the facade, whether it's a V2 or a V3, you have a shunt in place that allows you to point those requests to the proper system uh, in order to serve that response. Okay. And then finally, data formats. Here is, the, you might have an HTML5 developer who would really like to see things in JSON. On the other hand, you have a Java app developer who's got a whole bunch of libraries that they depend on and they've used for years to handle so requests and responses. So how we do this, we'll just take, we're gonna take a look at two quick examples. Here is, um, this would be the point of view from the developer who has the SOAP library and likes working in SOAP. They would do a post, you know, say they wanna get um, a collection of accounts, they do a post with the, all the necessary SOAP stuff around it to your accounts URL, and then you're gonna mediate um, that into this more complicated backend system and return SOAP. So this essentially, the facade, is not actually adding any real value here in terms of data formats. It's just doing the previous use case of, of doing the URL mapping. But in this case, where your developer wants to do an HTTP GET instead of a POST and see JSON coming back as, their, as the response format, um, then it's over here on the response side where the facade actually starts to do some interesting stuff where, where SOAP comes into the facade on its way to return that response and a, a data mapping happens. You know, usually this can be done with XSLT or, or something like that to, to translate that stuff from SOAP into JSON and the developer, from the developer's perspective, this just looks like a really cool modern API that she's gonna to wanna to use to build her app, but, but behind the scenes, it's this more complicated enterprise thing. That's the core idea of the kind of the core five patterns that we, that we see in terms of using uh, the API facade. Um, the last little bit here is the idea that uh, a lot of folks use that fa the facade pattern to, to front their internal systems and for all the reasons that we talked about here, but all the same problems that you have with ex internal systems can also happen with external systems. We've seen a number of, of cases where people have, their core business relies on external services and sometimes those service providers, whether providing SOAP or JSON or RSS or XML, plain old XML, they sometimes change their pricing models and the business, if the business is tied into that particular service provider, their profit margins, uh, get eaten away or maybe the service levels degrade or some other business relationship has changed. If you put the facade pattern in place, then your apps that consume those external services can, can expect one sort of canonical model of consuming those APIs. And then if you implement that in the facade, then you can very easily plug and replace those other systems that you were relying upon. You can imagine rerunning this whole presentation and looking at it from the perspective of consuming the API. All those same ideas are still in place. You would build out the error facade first, you would build out those data stubs, and you've pretty much created internally your canonical model of service consumption, and it gives you that flexibility to, to rip and replace those other things. If there are any questions that folks have, we can grab those now. Okay, so we have a question here from our Pete. Should the version number appear in the URL immediately after the domain name, or is it better to have application name after domain name? So you have billing accounts, um, should it be slash account slash v2 slash create? So, my, my strong feeling on this is the version number should be uh, the letter V followed by an ordinal number with no decimal point, so no version two point whatever. And that thing should be as far to the left as possible. Um, and uh, and that cause, because that implies the greatest, the greatest scope across the whole system. Now you, you have create there, and I'm hoping that's just, you were trying to throw an example together, but the create as a verb, that should be just coming from the HTTP uh, verbs, the HTTP actions. In this case, that would probably be a post if you're trying to do that. So Thomas asks, wouldn't all the shunting that you suggest make for a terrible complex layer? Uh, it could. You could. If you implemented this the wrong way, you could definitely end up with a whole mess of spaghetti. The alternative is to push, but it could get worse if you don't have it in the facade layer, right? You could push those, push these um, solutions down into like the specific silos, and then you've got spaghetti, but distributed spaghetti, so it's even worse. So the, the way to do that is to think of all of these as policies that you line up in the library in that facade and then be really smart about how you how you manage that and there are tools that help you do that um, you can get those from a number of vendors or you know, there are even some open source versions coming out nowadays so chris asks what would you recommend for a url pattern for a sandbox instance that that's all mock data well the biggest the biggest thing there is the url pattern should be the same as your production as your production server what changes is uh 
is the top level domain. So instead of uh, you know api.foo.com, you would have uh, test.foo.com uh, in there. And if you do that, then if you want, you can actually you can actually drop the mock param if it's only a mock server, and you can and you kind of streamline that. How can a GET request be transformed to a SOAP post specifically when the SOAP, requ SOAP post request size is huge? Yeah, uh, that that can happen. There are cases where um, the you, it's not just enough to have some some params in the in the URL, but in the in the case we're talking about, or at least I was talking about, if the developer is trying to get a just to get a read, you know, to do a, a read request, then that's the thing that we're trying. To translate. There's enough information in the original URL coming in that we translate that, that into a, a post to soap to wrap, and then the the facade layer takes care of assembling that um, assembling that soap package to get sent off. So what I won't, what I'm not suggesting is that um, if you if the developer app needs to put in a big request that somehow that magically gets transformed into uh, you know that would start as a get. That's not going to work, right? It always would have to be a post in that case if you have a big data payload coming in. Uh, it looks like Lindy. Um, what about version in the request header instead of putting in the URL? What will the drawback be of using in the request header? There's a lot of debate. There's a lot of good reasons, especially if you're, um, if you have multiple complex backend systems and you have dependencies across systems to put things inside of the header. My overall feeling is, is twofold. One is if you put it in the header, then it's invisible to developers. And my sort of rule of thumb is if it changes the code that the developer needs to write, and especially if it changes the libraries that they need to import into their code to do something, you should put it in the URL because then they can very quickly copy and paste it into the browser and hack through it and see, okay, this is what the JSON format looks like. Okay, this is what the XML format looks like. If you put it in the header, then you're forcing them into curl or some other um, uh, HTTP tool that's more advanced. Um, this is a controversial area. A bunch of people would slap me silly. Uh, for this, but if you look at the way most of the leading APIs do it, that format does show up inside uh, the URL. So, uh, so everything that I just said about, um, actually that question was about version, but everything I just said about format is actually applicable to version and vice versa. Uh, Matt Green asks, should every response follow a standard format that contains errors, if any, along with the response body, or should the response body change based upon sex or failure of the operation? Great question. I think there should always be a set of metadata that comes back in every single response. Um, in the case of a successful response, that might be things like the pagination and the overall count. But regardless, it should always include um, what was the actual request that was, was asked. Other than that, I feel like if you do have a successful response and an error response, it's perfectly normal for those, the payload itself to be, um, to be different. Uh, my, one of my strong recommendations is that the, the error response be really, really verbose. And you don't want to put that verbosity inside of every response if it's a good response because the developer is never going to read it. What is the functional difference between the raise and mock parameters again? Great question. Uh, the one changes the HTTP status response and one changes the actual payload. So putting raise in there is what's going to change the HTTP code. So you would say raise 401 or raise 500 and that's going to send back the response in, as the HTTP status code. The mock actually changes what the, the payload is. So if you say mock equals true and you do a get on slash accounts, then that's going to give you a, a static mock version of, of all, the, uh, all the accounts that you, you, know, you would send back. So one is the HTTP code and one is the actual body of the response. Matt Green asks, what are your thoughts on REST sitemaps? Worth it? No. My opinion is they're not. I mean, any effort that you would put into maintaining the sitemaps or maintaining all the links that you would send back in a response, you're much better off putting that effort into really interesting error messages and really being thoughtful about, um, about how a developer views each request independently of any other, any other request. But that's, that's my opinion. There are a bunch of people that would have the other opinion. Andrew says, git slash accounts should return all accounts, right? What if, what if you want to prevent this? What would the URL request look like? So there's two ways that we can, you can talk about preventing it. One is the developer explicitly says, I want, these, I want some pagination parameters like uh, limit and offset. Um, other than that, the, the API team definitely needs to set limitations. You can, the limit should have some max, whether the user specifies the limit or not. Something like 50 or 100 is usually a good max to put on, but then it's really important to clearly communicate that to the developer that there's a max there because if you set the limit at 50, and they're trying to explicitly ask for a limit equals 65, then 
uh, it's going to feel very non-deterministic that your API is not working the way that they think it is. So you really need to clearly communicate that. And my opinion is to fail fast. If they make a request and they're one of any of their parameters goes above or below an acceptable limit that you have in place, error that response out because this is going in code, which is then going to be deployed and live forever. You're much better off having them experience it at design and development time than in production time because you know they weren't paying attention that they asked for 52 when you only give back back 50. Andrew's asking a uh, follow-up question. To be more clear, if you're fetching accounts from the database where state equals Washington, how would that work? Oh, okay, sure. So um, in this case, it would just see, I would say um, slash accounts, question mark, state equals Washington would be the would be the query to just query on state equals Washington. Um, hopefully that, that is what you're looking for. Um, my colleague, who's the CTO of Apogee, Greg Braille, he also has a really cool presentation um, called uh, REST APIs for SQL developers, which does the kind of a nice little mapping of if you're thinking about things in a SQL way, here's how to think about it instead in a RESTful API format. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in. As I mentioned, we have the YouTube stuff, youtube.com slash Apogee, uh, the IRC channel, the Google group, or either send me an email right here, brian at apogee.com, or contact me uh, on Twitter, I'm Landlessness, or just go ahead and follow me there. I usually mostly talk about API stuff. And, uh, and we'll go from we'll go from there. Bye now.